Thank you all for being here. Um, I'll start off with a few questions, and then we can take some from the audience. We'll have mics that are that will be passed around. Um, but Simone, I'll start with you since your film uh, opened the program. Uh, when I think about your film, my mind me immediately goes to uh, the film's perspective and these very evocative, specific images. Uh, the swimming that happens at the base of the waterfall, uh, the motorcyclist on the side of the road seemingly being ignored by every passing car, and of course the opening shot of William taking that dive from the bridge. Um, so I'm curious to hear where the film began from you. Does it, did it start with a specific image or action that you then constructed your film around? Well, thanks Tyler for, for the invitation. I'm very happy to screen the film here at Lincoln Center with these great filmmakers. And I'm talking about a little bit about the process. Um, at the beginning, I was uh, working on this film that was supposed to be a very formal film, uh, just about the bridge. I was just shooting the bridge and cars passing by, the sky, the river. And then I met this guy, William, and he told me that he could jump from the bridge, so I was impressed, and he did that. So it was great. And then he introduced me, his girlfriend. So I thought that, well, it wasn't just me. He told me that I should make a film about them, being a couple. So I just started to work with them. And uh, well, that's, that, that's the way that I started to work in the film. Where did you shoot the film? It's, uh, I'm, I'm from Medellin, and it's a place called Bolombolo, which is one hour from the city. And it's, uh, it's a small town in the Cauca River, which is a, a very important river in Colombia that is, actually this is something going on with the river because they have built this hydroelectric project. So they are destroying the river to make energy. <laughs> that's going on, that's what is happening right now. But when I shoot the film, that, that wasn't a problem. But now, like two months ago, they have closed the river so the water is very slow, so you can cross by walking the river. You see, like, this is a huge river and very strong river with a lot of water, and now is is not the same. I, g I guess going off my first question, the film makes minimal use of dialogue to give us information. Could you tell us more about working with silence in your film, silence as it relates to dialogue? Well, I, I usually work with silence in, in my films, because uh, maybe I talk a little bit too much, so I like to, to I like silent films, uh, and I also like the way when you have this silent film and you have like a small phrase, it's very important, you know. So you have a little bit dialogue, and it becomes really important. Uh, I, I think all of the films in this program are, albeit in different ways, concerned with conveying a sense of interiority or in intimacy and Jacqueline I think this especially applies to your film since uh, for I think in nearly every scene the lead actress is in the scene um, and yet her characterization her development is so internal and nuanced could you tell us about working with uh, your lead actress directing her through the scenes Yes, uh, as you said uh, it's very internal and it was my aim to depict the inner life uh, what is a, tri a, a risk in the cinema when you want to portray internal worlds without um, having too much of a description by secondary characters. So we worked very internally. We worked uh, through letters. I never rehearse, up until now at least, because I really aim for the spontaneity of the performance each time. And uh, I gave her some letters and some diary notes of the character and she read them, and because she's very talented and smart, she came up with this very um, subtle performance and mood uh, sh shifts that she made. And also another aim for me was to, um, apart from the inner world of her, to somehow show the bipolarity of a day. So in a way we have a scene that it's happy, and then a scene that it's not so happy, and I want to show how Every day it's more like a collage of moments, very different in texture, rather than having a unity. Because I have never experienced a day, let's say, personally, that it's one. It's very various. So um, this is how we worked. It was like talking about um, 
the, the, the different textures of the day along with her thoughts, internal thoughts. Could you talk more about that? I'm I was curious to hear um, how you thought about time and duration uh, when making this film, because we, you take us through New Year's Eve um, with such a, as you said, textured and specific sense of time and place, and you show us these uh, casual moments um, through often long, unedited takes. So yeah, can you tell us how you found that form to telling your story? I, I'm really interested in um, depicting uncut time. I think that it gives much more space for the audience to really enter the moment of the character rather than manipulating through editing. So I just, it was a conscious decision from the very, very beginning to shoot sequence as a shot and no decoupage, no shot list uh, was involved. And I just wanted to go with the flow of each moment just to follow her. Some of the shots were choreographed like the New Year's shot, because of the many extras, of course, it was choreographed, because I wanted to have the essence of losing her and finding her, exactly correlating with her internal essence of losing and finding herself, in a way. And um, other shots were not choreographed, like the park shot. We just shot it once. We never went for a second take, because I really thought that the spaciousness of time can be depicted through having unity in time itself and not trying to play around with cutting from different angles. And also I think that what gets succeeded with this way is to somehow forget the camera because w and, and forget the filmmaking in a way as a, a technique because editing, I think it's super filmmaking because you cut, cut, cut. And here we just let it flow and whoever entered, entered. And whoever did not enter, did not enter the moment. Javier, I would like to know how, uh, how you found your form and approach to your film, Misericordia, but uh, first, can you tell us how you encountered this island at first, and what about it uh, compelled you to make a sculpted portrait of its community? Well, um, thank you, first of all, for having us here, and I'm very happy to be showing my film. Uh, and thanks for coming. So, um, in my case, um, I make documentary films, and I, they always very, very tied to different places that I feel some sort of attachment. And Brazil is a country that I always felt a lot of attraction, and I traveled there like a uh, couple of times, like long, long, long trips, so I could get a sense of the country, and I felt like a, a deep connection that I wanted to explore with, with the film. And on the other hand, I also work with dreams a lot, not because I just like the dreams, but uh, uh, dream analysis is something that, um, yeah, I have been uh, doing for many years, and I felt it could be a good idea, or like uh, s to try to approach this, you know, to try to go to a place and explore it through through what people dream. So basically, I went there, uh, and Bahia is a state of Brazil, uh, also a very special state because it it um, it was the place in which when there was a slavery, uh, the slaves from Africa uh, arrived into Brazil. So the population of, uh, of black people that is very, very high, and then the heritage of that black uh, uh, community, even though then it was, um, it's, it's very strong. So there's like a layering between indigenous background and then the, the black and European, and it makes a place that has a very strong energy, uh, very, very strong, and it's hard to tell. So that's also, um, it was a good place to, uh, I think, to, to try to go and, and see what happened. And uh, I got an art uh, residency over there, in, in that island, so I didn't actually know where I was going. I know, I knew that I was, was going to the state, so I knew what I would more or less encounter, but I didn't know exactly uh, what would I find in that island. And then I was there for three months, and uh, I just went out with my camera. And it was um, strange because I was mainly the, the only white guy there, and um, it was very, very, for me, I think more than for them. Um, so the fact that I would first go with my audio recorder and ask for dreams, it was easier, I think, for everybody, for me and for them. And I, I basically was asking for dreams and dreams and dreams and collecting dreams. And those dreams, in a way, also uh, resonated with my own um, mind, and then I could go out and start to film. So it was a, a process, was parallel process, dreams, and then I would go out and shoot, and uh, it was like that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Did you find that um, recording 
the drains of the residents was an easier way to sort yeah, of approach the history or the... Yeah, because the I think that you can get to know a place and you can be like, I'm gonna do like a political and uh, ethnographic film and you can just go and ask them for like very, you know, like obvious questions about, and I think that um, when you ask about dreams, you kind of go through the unconscious and the unconscious hides things that sometimes we're not aware of them and in a way that you talk about them and they let me show a place in a way that um, also reveals certain things about this place that maybe they're like maybe like layered, but I think, and I was aware like how, how fucked up I it is what we did over there, the colonization and, uh, and the, the, the whole thing about the slavery. It's still, I think, in the unconscious of everybody, uh, the black population and also the white population. And uh, so I know that maybe it's a little bit underneath, but it's also like uh, in, uh, in the unconscious, it's actually there, but it's not articulated in a way, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. And what you mentioned, you worked more or less alone on this film. Uh, I was uh, on my own. Is this generally your approach to when you're making your documentaries? Is it um, something you prefer? Is it something that you perhaps find just yeah. out of necessity? Well, my films are always about my own process, about investigating something, and also the way that I relate to, to something, to a space and to a place. But also, because also it's my own dream of this place, so I think it's a, a dream of dreams, right? Because I always, I also contemplate, it's very contemplative, and. I am describing something, but then I choose what I'm showing, and I show in, in, in a certain way. So then you also have my own image of that place, and my own construction, and my own dream, right? Uh, and yes, my approach is always that I go out by myself. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I do everything by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucille, I'll turn to you. Um, what draws me so much to your film is the way it employs repetition. Uh, in order to get us to a new or different place. And I don't think the film ever fails to move us forward to a different place, and yet each scene, I think, is, uh, to reference the title, echoing either visually or, um, or orally, something we've seen previously. Um, so could you talk about using repetition in your film to get us to a new or even just different place? Um, I think the film is actually about like um, accumulating different situations, and how the sound builds around it, like it gets more intense through a film. Like I feel it's like building to get to the sea or, or the beach part. So yeah, I think th that's what I was trying to do. Like build it up, like make it more and more intense through the film with the sound and like the um, planos. Uh, shots. Like the shots getting shorter, like and working with that and, and how the water appears more and more and more through the film. So it's, I think it's that like, more like accumulation than repetition in a way. Could you talk more about um, the important sound had for you in the mm -hmm. film? Um, I think it plays a very subtle but distinct role throughout. Yeah, so if you can talk more about that. Um, I wrote the screenplay with um, Francisco who also did the post-production for the sound. So um, when we were writing, we were also already thinking about how it was going to sound and in which moments it was going to be more important or more intense. So it was like something really important even in the beginning of the filming process. Um, and yeah, I was trying to find like little sounds that we listen when we are alone because it's a very intimate film. Uh, so we we thought that at night there's when you're alone at night you pay more attention to different sounds that are around and and we thought about um, the heating and the f like the freezer and little things that you listen at night and how they start to appear more weird in a way like you listen to something and you don't really know what it is and you start thinking that it might be something else so playing with that and the idea of um, the water, and it was pretty much that. I'll ask one more question, then we can open it up to the audience. Um, but y your film also features a really remarkable natural performance from its lead actress. Did you have her in mind as you were writing the film, or did, was this something that was cast afterwards? Um, when we wrote the screenplay, we uh, like um, the girl who plays her friend. 
she was the assistant director also, and she wanted to appear in a scene. <laughs> and she knew this uh, actress. So we, we all met and we talked and worked for like two months because she, she mostly plays in theater. So like turning it into a film, we, we had to work like together to, to try to lower it a bit. <laughs> so we, we worked a lot and we rehearsed a lot and talked about the character and everything. And yeah, I think she, she did a really good job. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we can take any audience questions. If there are any, just raise your hand and a mic will come to you. Uh, yes, sir, right here. Hola, Lucilia. Vamos, Argentina. Yeah, my question is, um, like you were mentioning before, about the repetition of water, the theme of water. <coughs> I was wondering what the culmination of those thoughts and themes uh, really meant in the end? Like, what were you trying to communicate with those things? Um, the film started with, uh, I actually got my ear clocked. <laughs> so, um, like, I thought it would be good to make a, a short, like, short films have, like, so, like, not a lot of extension. So making it about a little situation and try to make it bigger. And the water shots, like, came naturally, like, um, like it was, as, like I was telling him, with the accumulation and making it bigger and more intense, more intense, and it was just like naturally that it was going to be around the water. Like, it was a small situation and when we tried to make it bigger, it was just water. <laughs> it's about that, so. Thank you. right back in that direction. There's another question right here. Um, hi. Uh, is it Jacqueline? <laughs> hey. Um, so I'm not sure. I don't. I was trying to form a question, but it, it's not necessarily a question. I was just hoping to hear a bit more about the themes of mortality in, in terms of uh, sort of that, the dream that your character is describing into the film and how that sort of facilitates uh, the party and then also feelings of loneliness. I, I couldn't hear the oh. theme of mortality. Yeah, the mortality and that being related to the themes of loneliness and the party scene and just where the story sort of came from. Okay, yes, thank you for the question. Yes, I think uh, loneliness is part of a very big uh, existential journey that we all go through eventually in our life and mortality is the biggest question. So I think that it's, um, they're very interrelated as notions because what we know is that the very cliche that we are born alone, we die alone, and then in the meanwhile, somehow we try to relate to people, create stuff, but we all know that it's a definite uh, lonely and individual end for everyone. Uh, so overall, as a um, theoretical umbrella, this is it. However, particularly here, I want more to emphasize the idea that we don't know if she has really someone. She goes to groups of people, yes, they like her, they don't really like her, she tries to belong there, she tries to withdraw, but we don't know if there is someone. And in the dream, we get a sublim subliminal information that yes, a father exists or not, but at least if we dream of someone, at least in the dream they exist for us. So it's her father, and then somehow we have a continuation of the situation when she makes the phone call to wish New Year's. So somehow I want it, because I'm also very interested in dreams a lot. I have actually shot a dream, a film that is a dream, in a way. And I want to incorporate this language in a more elliptical and abstract way to let us know tiny bit detail more of her, and for her, of her universe, and of her belonging. Uh, we have time for one more question, one or two, um, if there are any. Uh, yes, way in the back. Um, I don't really have anyone specifically to ask, but it seems in all of your films there's a very loose storytelling structure. In other words, you don't introduce a problem in the first scene and then resolve it by the last. 
is this something that you kind of intentionally do or does it come naturally in the short story structure? The question is about your um, loose storytelling approach um, with your filmmaking. Um, is that accurate? Or? Yes, uh, and the second question was if it was uh, on purpose or if it was, ex okay, cool. Uh, yes, of course it was on purpose. <laughs> uh, I think life is a loose storytelling in reality. If someone wants to narrate everyone's personal stories, you always miss some bits, you always exaggerate other bits. It's never a beginning, middle and end in real life. And personally, because I want to make films that touch upon real life, not realism, but the experience of being here in this universe, I think that the most appropriate way is to have an elliptical, abstract, and loose storytelling in the way that, of course, there are films that have a very structured narrative, and I, I, I love them, and they are very um, more academic and traditional in a way. However, they are very, um, for me, they are very fabricated in a way. I like them, but they're fabricated. I think that all films have in common this um, elliptical element that allow us, allow the audience more space to, for more interpretations and more personal feelings attached to each and every film. So yes, it's a very conscious uh, choice. Um, uh, I'm, I'm working in these films. Um, I'm not writing this film, so I'm just shooting. And for me, shooting and editing is like the, the, the moment when I'm starting to, to make the film to have a little bit more sense. But at the end, the film is like a collage because I have a lot of situations and I have to link them and to make them take a little bit of sense. So that's why the film looks like a little bit too, too uh, desarmada. Destroy it. <laughs> That's it. Um, in my case, I think what she said about um, that we all had in common in, in our films about leaving it like loose. I think it's interesting to do stuff like that with short films because you, like that, you don't have a lot of extensions. So giving a story and seeing what people think about it, I think it's it's a cool thing to do. Otherwise, it would be like just things happening all the time in, in the end. Um, and in my case, I think I, I had like very different interpretations <laughs> of the film, which is interesting, because I, I don't really think, like, why she goes to the sea, I don't know. I mean, I think it's open to interpretation, and, and I think, I also, I don't know, I don't usually make, um, like, stories, um, uh, like, like like see like linear like um, um, so yeah I I like doing that <laughs> like leaving it open and and see what people find in my stories and and since it's it's very intimate I also think it, it I what I wanted to do it was like mixing the way um, the character felt and the actual things that were happening around her, so. And in my case, it's a dream of dreams, so dreams are not linear. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid we have to wrap it up there. We have a screening starting shortly here. Um, but Jacqueline, Simone, Lucila, Javier, thank you so much for being here and sharing thank your you. work.